with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to our generous underwriters on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And the Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Thursday, March 16th, we are studying John chapter 14, verses 8 to 14. In today's text, Jesus' conversation with his disciples in the upper room on Monday, Thursday continues. When Philip asks Jesus to show them the Father, Jesus tells his disciples once again what he has been teaching them all along. Whoever has seen Jesus has seen the Father. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Peter Ill. Pastor Ill serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Millstadt, Illinois. Pastor Ill, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Glad to be back. Welcome to the bunker. That's right. Uh, for those of you who aren't here, which is all of you, uh, <laughs> Pastor Apple has this wonderful bunker studio in his church basement, and it is delightful, but it's also delightful to get to uh, sit uh, face-to-face and and record radio uh, doing the old-timey magic. That's right. I think last time we were together in the bunker, we, we asked if there was perhaps a better name for this studio. Bible Bunker, I kind of like. I do like that. That's because good. it's alliteration. Right. But if someone has a better idea for a, a basement studio, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org and let us know what we should name this. So for now, it's the Bible Bunker. Pastor Ill, welcome. We're in John 14 today. Tell us some context. What should we know as we prepare to look at our section of the chapter today? As we go through John 14, this is a wonderful uh, collection of things that Jesus has taught to his disciples and to the whole church. I'm reminded of a a Christian that I used to get to serve uh, before he was called to be with the Lord, who at one point said, at my funeral, pastor, I want you to preach John 14. And and I thought, well, that's that's kind of a big chapter. What what part? And he said, the whole thing. All the Christians and my kids all, they all need to hear this. <laughs> and And it was just a delightful reminder that uh, there is so much hope and comfort for us all throughout John 14. Uh, But John 14 has a really interesting way of moving. Uh, The previous section that goes in chapter 14, verses 1 through 7, talks about how the, uh, the only way to the Father is through the Son. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And that is a wonderful place to uh, to hang your hat and to think about the importance of the Christian religion centers on who Jesus is and what Jesus does. But then when we get into this reading, Jesus starts to emphasize, based on Philip's question, that he and the Father are one, and this idea of the, the unity of the Father and the Son is a really big deal. It's a big deal in the rest of John. Uh, But before I get distracted by myself, uh, the final section, what's coming up next, is Jesus starts to talk about how he and the Father together send the Holy Spirit. And so throughout John 14, you have wonderful echoes of of Trinitarian teaching. Uh, This is one of those doctrines that isn't taught— that is taught in Scripture, but the word Trinity never occurs in Scripture. But one of the places that you look to see the Trinity is the Gospel of John, and I would argue John 14 is one of those places where you see a lot of Trinitarian teaching uh, just kind of oozing out, um, because that's the way that Jesus confesses the reality of, of our Trinitarian God, Father and Son who are united, but also distinct, uh, who also send the Holy Spirit. I think you you were telling me earlier the, the story of the gentleman who asked you to preach on John 14, all of it, because the, the entirety of the Christian faith is found here in this chapter. Yeah, and uh, there is there is so much hope and comfort uh, there, there are times, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure how baptism maybe filters in, um, but, but that's okay. Uh, I, I'm not going to correct him. Um, and, that's right. and especially now that he's with Jesus, he really doesn't need my correction. Um, he's got Jesus for that. 
Okay, so in in John 14, we see the teaching of the Holy Trinity very clearly put forward for us in a rather orderly way, as you were saying. We've got the middle section for us today, verses 8 to 14. Thinking about maybe a little bit more context in John, we're in chapter 14. What's been happening in this part of John leading up to it? Maybe some themes that we see in John that we're going to see repeated in this in this text. Talk a little bit more about that. So this this idea of the unity of the Father and the Son runs all the way through John, kind of picking up in the prologue at chapter 1, verse 18, uh, as Jesus, as uh, John writes that no one has ever seen the Father uh, except the Son who makes the Father known. And so we get exactly that uh, as Jesus makes the Father known. Uh, then, the, kind of taking a jog through earlier John, in chapter 5, uh, Jesus mentions that the Father has given all judgment to the Son, and so the Son is is the one who does all of the judging because his Father has given him that role. In John 6, uh, in the Bread of Life discourse, uh, in verses 44 and 55, Jesus says that no one can come to the Son unless they are drawn by the Father. And that's, that's its own kind of interesting uh, thing to think back on because we think of that as being the work of the Holy Spirit to draw people to Christ. But here Jesus says that it's the Father's will to draw people to him. Um, in John 10, uh, especially in verse 30, Jesus just flat out states that he and the Father are one. And then uh, we have our reading today that talks about Jesus is here to show the Father, and they are one. And then finally, in John 17, in that great high priestly prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, that chronologically comes just a few hours after this, uh, even though there's a few chapters in between, uh, Jesus talks repeatedly in his prayer that he and the Father are one, and he asks uh, the Father to to unify the church as one in the same way that the Father and the Son are one. And so this theme of the unity of the Father and the Son, they're distinct because Jesus talks about the Father, but they're also one because Jesus says they're one. Uh, I, and I want to break out my, my like slide rule and calculator and stuff and figure out how all this works. Uh, how can you be distinct and one at the same time? Uh but Jesus doesn't invite us into a conversation about theological engineering. Uh, Jesus simply confesses the truth. He isn't the Father, but he is one with the Father, all at the same time. Uh, and I think it's really important, as we say what we are saying, that we also kind of put up a quick uh, quick little uh, fence and say what we're not saying. Mm. Uh, there are some times when people will say that uh, in the Old Testament you have God the Father, and then uh, God became Jesus— uh, or became the Son, and then after Jesus' ascension, uh, God became the Holy Spirit. And so you have this kind of a, a one God who shows himself in three different ways. Uh, we are not saying that, not at all. Uh, that is usually referred to as the, the heresy of modalism, of one God in three different modes. Uh, but Jesus is praying to the Father. Jesus is talking about the Father and making it clear he isn't the Father, uh, Jesus is distinct from the Father and yet one. Mm. And the Father and the Son together are going to send the Spirit. But at no point is there ever any confusion that uh, the Father becomes the Son, becomes the Holy Spirit. These are three distinct persons in one wonderful Trinitarian Godhead. Uh, and, and I don't understand it, and that's okay, uh, but this is what the Scriptures confess, and we keep confessing along with the Scriptures exactly what exactly what we're given not adding anything to it, nor taking anything away from it. Yeah, that's right. We, we would confess what the scriptures teach us, no more, no less. And even in those moments when we cannot fully wrap our minds around it, still we rejoice in this truth of who God is, who he has shown himself to be for us, and, and how that then works for our salvation, which I think you see throughout the Gospel of John and our section in this whole chapter that who God is, how the Father, the Son relate to each other is, is, is the primary topic for our conversation today. All of this is for the purpose of bringing about our salvation, right? This isn't just some sort of, what you say, theological engineering. We're, we're, we're not doing any kind of theological engineering for the sake of showing off how smart we are, and, and Jesus certainly isn't trying to do that by any means either. He's teaching us the truth of who God is for the sake of our salvation. And I, I think that's why when we keep that in mind, it helps us to 
understand why our pastor might want to have something called Holy Trinity Sunday toward the beginning of summer, right after the Sunday of Pentecost. What, what's the point of even saying the Athanasian Creed, Pastor? It, it sounds so confusing. Well, the point is that we would rejoice in who God has shown himself to be for the sake of our salvation. Absolutely. And we, we always want to do that as absolutely fully as we can. And there is a place where our human minds uh, are just limited by uh, by what we don't know and can't know. But we are going to say absolutely everything that Scripture says, and we're not going to pull any punches or hold anything back. And so when Jesus starts to talk about he, himself and the Father being one, even though they're distinct, we will confess exactly that, yeah. even if it doesn't... Uh, fully and completely makes sense uh, to us. And even if we still have plenty of questions about it, we'll still say exactly what Scripture says. Yeah, that's right. And, that, and again, this is why the doctrine concerning the Holy Trinity is so important. One of the ways that I've, you know, I'm, I'm sure as a pastor, Pastor Ellie, you've, you've had moments where you've taught the Holy Trinity and and maybe you've struggled with what's the best way to express this? How, how do I how do I teach this? And I think the, the closer we stick to the truth of what Jesus says in the scriptures, the better. The The way that I've most recently landed on trying to not explain, but to confess what the scriptures teach about the Holy Trinity are seven sev- separate statements. And you've mentioned a couple of them them already. So I'm going to run this by you and, and you tell me what you think. Okay. So the, the first three statements go like this. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And those those three, again, are very easily seen from the scriptures. The next three, the Father is not the Son, and vice versa. The Son is not the Holy Spirit, and vice versa. And the Father is not the Holy Spirit, and vice versa. I think I got those three. And again, based on what you've been saying already, we we see that in texts. And then the last one is, there's one God. Those are, those are the seven truths that I, I think you see very clearly in the scriptures. It's very easy to compile lists of passages that teach all those things, and they're all true at the same time. How that's possible, that's where I think our minds sort of like, wait, what? But we confess it because that's what the scriptures teach. And that's where then the word Trinity, I think, is very helpful. How do you describe seven statements like that, all true at the same time? Well, that's the Trinity. I don't, what do you think? I, I like that. That's a really, uh, as you were running through them, I thought, that sounds an awful lot like the first half of the Athanasian Creed that we do confess on Trinity Sunday. Uh, and you could probably add another three statements about uh, the work of Jesus Christ and and be good to go. There you go. Uh, but, uh, but I like the whole Athanasian Creed, so I don't want to summarize oh, it too much. Sure, that's right. Uh, <laughs> but that does really carry that exact idea. and And as we talk about all of this. I know it sounds like this is a lot of of introduction, uh, but this draw that Philip has as he gets to Jesus and says, show us the Father and that's enough for us. We, we end up with a lot of that in our own day, and we see that other places in Scripture too, where people say, just show me God. Just I don't need to be I don't want to mess around with any more of this like intermediary stuff, Jesus. Just show me the Father and hmm. seeing the Father, that's enough for me, which... I've always wondered how Philip said that with a straight face, but that's another story, I think. I've always wondered how Jesus responds to that with a straight face. But, uh, that's also true. But, but we'll, we'll get to that. One, one more thing in terms of introduction, just thinking about the, the context. As you said, the prayer in John 17 is only going to be a few hours removed from what we're reading here, but is quite a few chapters away. There's a lot of material. Jesus here is speaking on Monday, Thursday in the upper room. How does, how does that context play into what Jesus says today? This has a lot of emphasis of the last things that Jesus is teaching his disciples before his betrayal and before his, his crucifixion and before his departure. Throughout John, Jesus talks about the time when he won't be with his disciples anymore, starting with the crucifixion. Uh, and even though he does reappear to his disciples, he's not with them as fully and in the same way. His departure kind of begins at his crucifixion, and even in the resurrection, he's he comes back, but he's not as regularly with them, it seems, as he has been uh, during the rest of his incarnation. And so this is a period of Jesus' last words to his disciples. Um, the verses that come immediately before our reading talk a lot about his departure, and he's, he encourages them to not be afraid because he is going to prepare a place for them, uh, and then 
here he gets into the reality of of who he is going to be with as he's doing that preparation. Uh, Jesus uh, is going to be with the Father. Uh, and this is where in our creeds we confess that Jesus is ruling and reigning over all things at the right hand of God the Father. And that's where Father and Son are together uh, as Jesus is doing his, his wonderful work of being the Messiah still uh, for us. And so for the disciples, they look at it as, don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus is about to not be here the same way. We look at it and sometimes think, wow, how cool would it have been to be like, like one of the disciples and spend years with Jesus hearing his teaching. But we sometimes forget that even now, Jesus is ruling and reigning over all things for us, continually speaking to us in his word, continually providing for us his gifts through baptism and the Lord's Supper and the forgiveness of sins. And so we take those promises to heart, and uh, we, we never start to think that we've gotten second shift yeah. uh, because we have all of the same promises of God that the, that the 12 in the upper room had. Mm. Well, I think a, a text particularly like this, we see that we are not getting the, the secondhand material in some sort of lower sense than the disciples because the disciples themselves— as we see in our text today and later in this this same conversation, they don't understand at the moment what they're getting from Jesus. It's really only after the resurrection and after Pentecost that they come back to these words, and then everything kind of clicks. They get it. And in that sense, we're in the same boat with the disciples because we live after the resurrection. We've seen the whole story. We've heard the whole account. And so these texts, too, for us are enlightened by the fact of what Jesus has done after he said them chronologically. So, I mean, a, a text like this, I, I think, really shows that. I, we were remarking on this, I think it was in yesterday's show with Pastor Wheatfelt, that a lot of this section of John is read in the church here in the season of Easter, which is perhaps a, a bit unusual when you think, well, wait, he said it on Monday, Thursday. But when you realize, oh, it's not until you've seen him crucified, raised, and ascended that you can really get it, then to have these texts during the season of Easter makes a lot of sense. It's like if you're listening to a presentation or a lecture or uh, if, you're, if you're a child listening to the words of your parents. You know, parents seem to have this penchant for saying things like, I know you don't understand this now, but you will later, so listen up. Uh, my folks always pulled that one on me. And <laughs> and most of those lessons I, I have figured out eventually. Uh, some of them I'm still waiting for, uh, but that's okay. Uh, but this is, this is very much the life of the church. Until we have had a chance to, to reflect on the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, a lot of the rest of Jesus' ministry doesn't make sense. Mm. And we need to always look at the words of Jesus through the lens of his suffering and death and resurrection. After we do that, we can then say, oh, all that other stuff makes sense, even if it didn't make sense the first time I read it through. That's why if you're, if you're reading through uh, the Gospel of John uh, along with this series, uh, maybe read the Gospel of John once and then go back and reread it. Uh, but always... You know, when you approach John's gospel or any other gospel, read it twice. Yeah, uh, I think is a really helpful practice for us. Yeah, maybe even three times. Y at least, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Reread. Reread the scriptures. They're meant to be reread. That's right. All right, we are in John chapter 14 this morning, Pastor L. We're starting off with verse 8. Philip said to him, to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. That's our text for today. That's John 14, verses 8 to 14. 
All right, so Pastor Earl, you've mentioned this already. Philip starts our text today with a question, a request. Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Take us into what Philip is asking. Philip is asking, by his own words, to see the Father. I do find it really uh, eyebrow-raising that Philip says, it's enough for us to see the Father. Uh, Who exactly does Philip think he is? That he can say, show us the Father, that's enough. I mean, come on, Jesus, if you only show us the Father, then then we'll have enough from your ministry. Who is Philip exactly to decide how much of Jesus' ministry is enough for him or for anybody else? Uh, and so this is part of my, my continual head scratch. But there is this strong compulsion to see God. Uh, looking backwards in the scripture, we can see this in the book of Exodus, when Moses is in the presence of God there on Mount Sinai, and he has the audacity to say, uh, God, show me your presence. And, and God says, well, I can't show you all of my presence, but here I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock, and as I pass by, I'll show you, um, I'll show you the back part of my glory. Uh, and even seeing the back part of God's glory made Moses' face shine. Uh, because he was so transformed by seeing uh, the lesser parts of God's glory, even though the the fullness of God's glory was too much for Moses. Uh, But still, Philip, who I'm sure knows this story, says, show us the Father uh, in much the same way. And even today, for for many Christians, we have this thought of, God, just show show us yourself, and and then we'll stop bothering you. Uh, Just give us a little bit more... And sometimes I think we would like to see God on our own terms. And part of me reads this question from Philip as, as, God, as I want to see the Father on my terms. So Jesus has come doing these works, uh, saying these words, uh, doing these signs. But just, Jesus, get to the nitty-gritty and show us the Father. Uh, and I think that indicates a there's still a an incomplete understanding of who Jesus is for Philip. Uh, and, and honestly, that's true for us today too, because I, I can't think of how often I've sat in confirmation classes and one of my students will say, well, I mean, God or Jesus, you know, same thing. Uh, and then they'll go on with their statement. And it's like, well, well, God, the father and, and Jesus Christ, the son, they're both God, but they're not exactly the same thing either. But I also don't want to jump down their throats. That's right. Um, yeah. But but we have that moment and that confusion of, wait, I don't fully get this, and I don't even know quite how to say it out loud in the best possible way. Uh, and so Philip says, "Jesus, you've done some great stuff, but we really just want to see the Father." Hmm. Um, kind of, kind of in a way that might miss the forest for the trees. Hmm. Uh, here is Jesus. Uh, the author to the Hebrews later will say he is the exact imprint of the Father, uh, the one who comes, and it is in him that we see, and as Jesus is about to say, it's in Jesus that we see and know everything we need to see and know about the Father. Uh, and we want to just blow right past that. Hmm. Uh, Jesus is where we see the goodness and the glory and the grace of God. And so even in these Lenten days, dear, dear friends in Christ, don't blow past Jesus in an effort to see the Father. Don't go rushing past the cross to get to heaven. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of good reasons why we want to do that. The cross shows suffering and weakness and vulnerability, and heaven shows that the victory has been won. We'll get, we'll get to heaven, and we'll get to the resurrection, and we'll get to all of those wonderful things. But, but stop for just a minute. And... And look to Jesus, the one who uses these words to call you to believe in him, who calls you to recognize his goodness and his glory, uh, because he is the one who shows the Father to you. And that, that is wonderful and gracious, and don't, uh, don't take it too lightly. Hmm. I, I'm thinking about what you're saying about our desire to see God on our own terms and that we would potentially try to blow past Jesus in an effort to see the Father. And I, and as you were talking about Philip, especially the, the second part of what he says, it's enough for us. This was something I guess I hadn't really thought about with this passage before, but, you know, Philip, it seems, is asking something to the effect of, you know, Jesus, we've, we've heard you, but come on, get to the point already. Show us the Father. As if there's another way to see the Father, apart from seeing Jesus and and 
hearing his word. You know, I mean, I'm thinking back to like John chapter eight, where Jesus tells those Jews who had believed in him, you know, if you abide in my teaching, if you listen to my word, you are my disciples. We're thinking forward to John 15, where Jesus in the same setting will tell his disciples, you know, to abide in him, this idea of living in him and remaining in him, that, that Philip is, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to read into this too much, but perhaps we see this today, that we, we just kind of like, okay, we, we've got the point, just show us the, the end already. As if like listening to Jesus and dwelling in his word isn't seeing, you know, we, we want that, that heavenly glory now without going through the cross as, as Christ is going through, you know, I mean, it's like, yeah, we, we want it ahead of time. We don't want to go through the whole, the whole following Jesus. Yeah. I, I don't know. I hadn't really thought about that before. Pastor L. There's, there's a desire sometimes of, yeah, yeah, I know that let's move on. Um, and every yeah. once in a while I hear this in Bible studies. People say, well, yeah, yeah, I know that part. I've heard this all before. And it's still really important that we sit back one more time and hear these same words, be them uh, the words of Jesus about he and the Father being one, even though we don't fully understand it and we really struggle with it sometimes. Uh, we, we're still called to think these things through and to hear them once again. Yeah. We're, we're never called to be done with a certain passage of scripture uh, or a certain part of who Jesus is. And so we'll always return and say, I've heard that before, but boy, I'd, I'd sure like to hear that again. Yeah, yeah, to dwell with Christ in his word and thereby see the Father. This is the gift that our Lord Jesus would give to us. It's the gift he's going to give to Philip and the others there in the upper room. We're going to keep looking at this text on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Peter Ill this morning about John 14. We will be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, March 16th. We're studying John chapter 14, verses 8 to 14 with Pastor Peter Ill. He serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Millstadt, Illinois. Pastor Ill, prior to the break, we looked at Philip's request. He says to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And all that St. John the Evangelist writes is Jesus said to him, but I've always pictured Jesus slapping his forehead. I think there's room for that. Uh <laughs> Um, this is where we have scripture recorded for us in written words, but what, aren't there days where you kind of want to see a video? Yeah. You know, what face did Jesus make? Yeah. Um, like Jesus paused, collected himself and then said to Philip, yeah. that's kind of how I picture it. Jesus looked at Philip quizzically and shook his head. <laughs> uh, right. And this is always part of the challenge of, you know, reading yeah. the, the gospels, especially in church, uh, how do you use the right vocal inflection? Right. You know, uh, where where is it appropriate to just give a deep sigh? Yeah. Uh, you know, Philip says, just show us the Father and that's enough for us. And Jesus said, I don't know, maybe that's overkill. It's, yeah, I know. And that's where we, we should be careful when we, when we read the scripture so that we don't insert emotions that are not written in the text. And this is a point we've made at, at other places in John's gospel where he does record Jesus' emotion for us. You know, he was greatly troubled in spirit or something like that. Here we don't know exactly what Jesus' reaction was. Other than the way that he does speak, I I think indicates a level of what I would call frustration at a minimum. You know, have I been with you so long? So that a a deep sigh or, again, you know, it's a, maybe a little bit less pious, a forehead slap, something like that seems like the emotion that's attached to it. And, and that it even comes through in the Greek. Uh, the Greek language, uh, as it's written in scripture, does carry those emotions sometimes a little bit better and more clearly than the English language can or does. And, and 
the Greek is, has a little bit of an edge to it as well. And so where we see here, have I been with you so long and you still? Uh, yeah, that that's that's a re- very good translation. It, and it captures the emotion that the that's there in the Greek language as well as the sense of the words themselves. Okay, so with, with that perhaps pious speculation or pious imagination as to how Jesus might have expressed this in other ways non-verbally, let's talk about what he says verbally. Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? And then ultimately his answer is, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So to take us into Jesus' words. Jesus is here simply flat out confessing, uh, if you see Jesus, you see the Father. Um, now, how does this work? Because Jesus is not the Father. Jesus is Jesus, and the Father is the Father. But if you see Jesus, you see the Father. And he's going to go on to talk about the unity of the Father and the Son, how he and the Father are indeed one, even though they're distinct. And, and we just, okay, yes, Jesus, we'll, we'll take you at your word. Because this is not a time for us to show Jesus how smart we are that we can figure him out, but merely to take the words of Jesus, to hear them and to believe them. Uh, later in in this passage, we will see that uh, Jesus is uh, a couple of times calling us, uh, as well as the disciples in the upper room, to believe these words and to believe in him. That's the end game and the goal of these words that Jesus gives, so that we would believe or believe even more in him. And so that's what we do, not trying to figure him out, but simply saying, Jesus, this is what you say about yourself, and so we do believe you. And so Jesus is the one sent by the Father, eternally begotten from the Father, uh, sent into the world so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life, as it says back in John chapter 3. Jesus has come to make the will of God the Father known and to to save humanity and all of creation by God's grace and by God's will. And so when you see Jesus, you see the Father. Um, that's what's really enough for Philip and for us. Uh, No matter what Philip thinks is enough, no matter what we think is enough, Jesus says, when I'm here, you see the Father. Whatever you're looking for, what I've shown you is actually enough, and you don't need to go making your own rules for enoughness. I'll show you enough. I will fulfill you and satisfy you with what I show you about myself and about the Father. Mm. So whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And I think this is important for us still today, as you were saying, you know, whatever you've seen from me, Philip, that's enough, because in seeing me, you've seen the Father. I think it's important for us still today, because that satisfies our longing too, where where we want God to, sh- quote, show us something, right? Show me this, show me that, show me yourself, somehow give me something and the, the Father's answer would be the same as the Lord Jesus' answer. Look at Jesus. When, when you see him doing something, you can know that that's what God thinks. And I think that that's ultimately the comfort, because how else would we know what God thinks of us unless he reveals himself to us? And the way that he's done this is through his Son, through Jesus, so that we don't have to wonder, we don't have to be left questioning what does God think of me? What what does he want me to know about himself? Does he love me? Does he hate me? We know those things because we've seen Jesus. Right. Um, this is where uh, Martin Luther would often talk about the, the revealed God, uh, who we see in Jesus, and the hidden God, or everything else about God that we don't necessarily see in Jesus. And when we start to look into the hidden God— Uh, and say, well, I need to see something else about God other than what has been revealed in Jesus, that's when it starts to get really scary. Um, Because God who hasn't shown us himself, being all-powerful and all-knowing, and without change, there there could be some some very uh, difficult and scary things that we don't know. But we don't look at what we don't know. And we don't try to find our satisfaction in what we don't know. We find our satisfaction and our comfort in what we do know. Jesus is the one who has come to make the Father known to us. And so when we see Jesus, we see the Father. That's what's enough for us. And that's that's as far as we need to go. Look to Jesus. 
Uh, once again, I'll borrow again from Hebrews. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith, or the beginner and ender of our faith. When it comes to our faith, we look to Jesus, and we don't need to uh, try to look behind Jesus to see what else is there. We say, Jesus has shown us enough. Yeah. And yeah. that's that's where our faith hangs mm-hmm. and, and cleaves to Jesus. Well, what you said there about we look to Jesus and don't try to look around Jesus or behind Jesus or somewhere other than Jesus, that would be the the converse of this statement, which I, I don't think is made explicit here, but I think follows from what Jesus has said and is supported by things Jesus says elsewhere. So he says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. But I, I think then conversely, whoever hasn't seen me, whoever hasn't seen Jesus actually hasn't seen the Father. That the the only way to know who the Father is, is to know Jesus. And if you think you've seen the Father apart from Jesus, you haven't really seen the Father. Right. And and this really kind of has a has an impact for us when we start thinking about other religions. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes people will say that, you know, Christians and uh, Jews and Muslims, uh, for example, all worship the same God. But if if say Jews or Muslims say that you can know God apart from knowing Christ, then then it's not the same God at all. Right. And and I think we need to uh, recognize the good intentions that those statements are given with, but also recognize no, uh, if if Jesus is not the way, the truth, and the life, and if Jesus is not the only way that we see the Father, then this is this is a different picture of God, and this is a uh, a very different God than the one that Jesus has revealed to us. Mm, right. So we want to hold on to Jesus' words. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That is what he teaches Philip and the others there in the upper room. He continues in, in perhaps that same frustration. How can you say, show us the Father? And then he, he continues to ask questions of, of Philip and the others, which I think the answers are, are meant to be obvious to them. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And then he, he points specifically next to his words. So take us into that that rhetorical question he asks, and then what he says about his own words and how they relate to the Father. Throughout the Gospels, as Jesus speaks, everybody looks at what Jesus says, and they say, he doesn't speak as one who is under authority, but he, uh, like the scribes, but he speaks like he has the authority. Uh, and they recognize the words of Jesus as being authoritative, um, and Jesus says, I've, I've spoken to you not like the scribes do and not like the experts and the teachers of the law, but I speak to you as, as the one who is revealed by the words of Scripture, and I tell you that these words are about me. And it seems like that's still not enough for you guys. Um, but at the same time that Jesus teaches authoritatively, he also indicates that he is one under authority, uh, as he says, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. And so now you have a shift from the words that Jesus has spoken to the works that Jesus does, but Jesus uh, contends that both the words and the works are not merely his own works, but these are the Father's works that he is bringing to light here in creation. And so the Father has sent him to speak authoritatively, to act authoritatively. Um, and we see that with, uh, still in John, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night back in chapter 3. Uh, he talks about the works and the words that Jesus uses. And Jesus is, even here in the upper room, saying, yeah, Nicodemus had it right. Uh, the words and the works that I do are the Father's, and I don't do them on my own. Jesus and Nicodemus had this whole conversation about, are you the teacher sent from God? And here in John 14, Jesus clearly answers, you betcha, um, or, or yes, I, I suppose, uh, not being so much the Minnesota Lutherans. Um, but, but the fact that Jesus makes this argument that uh, he is the one with the authority from the Father who authoritatively acts, not usurping the Father but simply declaring what the Father once made known, that's exactly what Jesus does. Well, I think that stems from the fact that Jesus is the one sent by the Father, and I know that that's not quite in view in our text yet, but certainly elsewhere in John, 
that's made plain that the father is the one who sends Jesus, that the, the son is the one sent by the father. And because of that nature of the sending, then Jesus has that authority from the father that the, when you, when you hear Jesus speaking, you know that you're hearing what the father wants you to hear. It's not something different. It's not something Jesus is making up of his own accord, but rather this is what God himself wants you to know. And I think this is something that when we talk about the Trinity, we sometimes struggle with a little bit because uh, usually when Christians depict the Trinity, we, we think in triangles, right? And so you have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and the Father's not the Son and the Son's not the Spirit, like All you said things. in your seven points. Yeah. Um, and, that's, and that's really good. Uh, but the way especially the Gospel of John speaks isn't so much about triangles where the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are equal, but more like uh, kind of... Kind of uh, descending lines where the father sends the son and then together the father and the son send the spirit uh, to creation and to the church. And then the spirit returns the believers to Christ uh, who brings them in turn by his death and resurrection to the father. And so you have the way that God reveals himself uh, kind of has a a delineated order, not that the the Son is any less than the Father, not that the Spirit is less than the Son, uh, but rather the way they work and the way it's revealed in Scripture is the Father does send the Son, and the Father and the Son send the Spirit, and the Spirit brings the church back to the Son and the Son then again to the Father. That's how Scripture talks, and, and we don't want to forget that either. Um, and so none of the persons of the Trinity are more important than any other of the persons of the Trinity. But they kind of function in their own orderly way at the same time. And yes, I know I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth at the same time, and I'm happy to do it. Uh, but I think it's something worth saying and worth kind of uh, holding in our minds. Talk about in verse 11, the way Jesus says, you know, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. We've seen this elsewhere in John's Gospel, where Jesus will draw attention to his works when it seems that his words have failed. Not that they failed, but they're they're not having the intended effect, perhaps. So talk more about the ro- the role of the works of Jesus and how they are meant to push people toward faith in the words. I think that the words of Jesus and the works of Jesus both reveal who he is and what he does. And there's a point where if the words aren't sinking in, if the words aren't getting it done, uh, then look to the works. Uh, And if, and if you look at the works and the works aren't sure, uh, then look at the words. But ultimately the teachings of Jesus and the miracles, or as John would say, the signs of Jesus uh, are never independent of each other. And so this, this idea that, Uh, I don't need to believe in Jesus' miracles to believe in his words, or I can believe Jesus' words, but I don't need to believe that he did any miracles. Um, Jesus, especially in the Gospel of John, never gives us that much latitude to pick or choose if we want the words or the works. They're a package deal. If you believe in the words of Jesus, you get his works too. And if you believe in the works of Jesus, you get the the words too, because uh, the words teach you about the works, and the works show the authority of Jesus to speak the words. And so I, I don't see this as a mutually exclusive of, if the words aren't good enough, then look at the works, but rather uh, hear the words and look at the works because the words teach you about why the works matter, and the works show you that the words matter too. And even just looking again at, at the way Jesus speaks in the previous verse, he, he says that the Father who dwells in me does his works. So the... I remember this elsewhere in John's gospel. I think it was in chapter 10 that comes to mind, especially that Jesus will emphasize the fact that the fact that the works he does are the father's works. So it's not only just seeing that he does works, but that the works that he does are the works that the father is doing. Jesus and the father are one. Uh, you can't you keep saying that. Well, I say what Jesus said, uh, But I keep saying it especially here because you can't break Jesus away from the Father. To say that Jesus does works that are exclusively Jesus' works uh, is is unfair and goes far beyond what Jesus says. Jesus says these are the Father's works, uh, and Jesus has been sent by the Father explicitly to do these works. And so 
is it Jesus works or is it the Father's works? Yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, and so we don't try to to separate uh, these two persons of the Trinity. Uh, we don't try to separate the Holy Spirit from Jesus and the Father either because they are the Father's works, they are the Son's works uh, that are there for, for the building up of our faith. So we look clearly to those things. Now, Jesus continues to speak about works as the text goes on, but now there's there's an added wrinkle. So verse 12, truly, truly, I say to you, a very important thing to pay attention to, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. So now it's not only Jesus doing the works of the Father, but now he's going to give those whom he sends works to do, and in fact, those are going to be even greater works. What's Jesus talking about? This this uh, can be a really difficult reading and can really start to throw us a little bit of a loop. The ones who come later, the ones who come after me, under my authority, will do even greater works than the ones that I do. Well, how do you get greater than the works of God in the flesh? Uh, I think that this is pointing ahead to John chapter 20, when Jesus shows up in the locked upper room. Uh, this would be an, a good question for another guest. Is it or for another guest? Is this the same upper room or a different upper room uh, that this discourse and uh, where the disciples are locked up after Jesus' resurrection is? Mm. Uh, that's a good question. You should ask somebody who's okay. not me, because uh, I'm not sure the answer. <laughs> but uh, the uh, Jesus talks about the greater thing that's to come. After Jesus' death and resurrection, he says, anyone who sins you forgive, their sins are forgiven them. And anyone who sins you do not forgive, their sins are not forgiven them. Uh, This is the greater work that Jesus authoritatively brings to his church to say, here, in the forgiveness of sins, that's the greater work. Now that you've seen the death and resurrection of Jesus, uh, the raising of of the dead, the raising of Lazarus, such a key and prominent part of uh, Jesus' miracles, uh, the cleansing of the lepers, the healing of the sick, and all of the other miracles that Jesus does, pales in comparison to this greater work of the forgiveness of sins that is brought for the whole world by Jesus' death and resurrection. That is what the disciples will see, and that is what the church today sees, this great gift of the forgiveness of sins mediated by the church at Jesus' command. Not because the uh, the, the disciples think they're so cool or because pastors think that because they wear the funny clothes, they get to uh, have magic Jesus powers. Jesus says, do this. And so the church does, by Jesus' authority, exactly what Jesus says we should do. Yeah, in in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, exactly we say these things. And I, I think I think you're right on with this idea of the greater works being the office of the keys and the forgiveness of sins. That idea of being sent, that the Father sends the Son, and then the Son sends his disciples. Going again to John twenty, I, I think that follows, and and maybe it hasn't been fully explicated as we've been reading John, you know, one verse after another. But I think when you start to see everything that Jesus says as a part of this discourse in the upper room, those things come together to make that the full picture that these greater works are those works that Christ is still doing now through his church in the forgiveness of sin. So the office of the keys, I mean, thinking the absolution, but also then in the the preaching of the word, in the administering of the sacraments, this is Christ still doing those greater works. And it's because he's gone to the Father, right? Because he's at the Father's right hand, ruling and reigning. He has the authority to do these things through his church today. And I think those thoughts and that theme is going to come back in John 17 as well. Yeah. And so as, we're, as we read John 14, we have strong echoes of John 10. We also have strong uh, foreshadows towards John 17, and then again towards John 20. And so it's all a, a unit and a whole. Um, you know, this is where I, uh, not Isaiah, well, Isaiah works this way too, but John... Uh, when you read John, it's like uh, looking at a spring or a corkscrew where the same thoughts come back deeper and deeper as you get farther and farther along. Um, So it's it's like you might need to read it twice or or three three times. times. Right, exactly, yeah. Yeah. That's right, that's right. Good advice, Pastor L, good advice. So Jesus in our text today concludes with these words, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Which sounds like a carte blanche. Let's just ask for any. Th- what is it? A carte blanche? What's Jesus saying? If 
if it's a carte blanche, I think there's a lot of little girls in this world who would get ponies. Um, uh, if we take this simply as, as long as you say, in Jesus' name, amen, then we should get what we want. Uh, and that is one way of reading this passage. Uh, it does seem like we can kind of manipulate manipulate Jesus into giving us exactly what we want. But as we read this alongside the Lord's Prayer and the third petition, thy will be done, we have this idea that when we ask for something in Jesus' name, it's like we're saying, Jesus, fill my mouth with what you want for me uh, and make me ask for that. And so when we ask for something in Jesus' name, we're not merely tacking on, Jesus, here are all the things that I want, uh, in your name, amen, but rather, O oh Lord, open my mouth and my lips will declare your praise. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and we let the Lord fill our mouths and our prayers with what he wants for us, and we simply slap on our amen. Mm-hmm. And and so here we ask that God's will would be done certainly among us, uh, not the way that we would desire it, but that the, the Lord give us what we know that we need. Because if it's up for us, or if it's up for the disciples in the upper room, any of this talk about Jesus leaving or going to the cross or going to the Father or preparing a place for them uh, would have would have dropped real fast. If they said, Jesus, give us what we want, uh, it wouldn't have included any of that stuff. Yeah. But that's exactly what Jesus has come to give them. It's exactly what Jesus has come to give us. And so we we gratefully receive it, and we hear these instructions with the intent that Jesus has given them, that they strengthen our faith, that we believe in him and that we believe in the Father, uh, that we don't ever look past him or try to move beyond him, but always say, Jesus has revealed exactly what we need to know. He is the one who comes with exactly enough. And so we receive those gifts, and we pray that he give us nothing more than and nothing less than himself. Mm. He and the Father are one, And when he gives us himself, we have there the way, the truth, and the life. We have there the peace that passes all understanding. There is no reason for our hearts to be troubled or for them to be afraid, because we have Jesus with us. I I can't remember who told me this, but I found it helpful that when Jesus teaches us to ask for the things in his name, rather than thinking of it as a formula— and, and it's not bad that we teach our children to pray in that way. I think that's a helpful thing to teach our children and, and any Christian to say, in Jesus' name, amen. I think it's helpful, as long as we don't understand it as some kind of magical formula. But rather to think about it, not so much as a formula, but think about what are the things that are found in Jesus' name? If you think about Jesus' name as the the box in which God wraps up all of the gifts that he would have you, what are the things that are found there in Jesus' name? life, salvation, forgiveness. I mean, all of those good things that God wants you to have, those are in Jesus' name. And when you ask for those things that are in Jesus' name, he is not going to fail to give you those things. If you ask for something that's not in Jesus' name, that's found outside of those good gifts, then he's not going to give you that. And that's actually for your good. And I I wish I remember who taught me that, but I've always found that helpful. And bringing up the Lord's Prayer, I think, is a fantastic thing because we know that those are the petitions that our Lord Jesus has given to us. And when we ask for the things he wants to give us, he will not fail to give them. And they're only good things so that we we hang our hat on a promise like this rightly and prov- have that comfort that God wants us to have, that all of the good things that are found in Jesus' name, he will not fail to give it. And so we ask boldly for those things. Pastor Peter Ill is pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Millstadt, Illinois. He's been helping us today to study John 14, verses 8 to 14. Pastor Ill, thanks for being our guest today. Blessings to you and to all of our listeners. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any suggestions for the name of the Bible Bunker, send us an email. If you have any questions about John's Gospel, please send us an email. You can send that to kfuo at kfuo.org. You can also download the KFUO app on your phone. That's a great thing to do. You can use that to send a message to us as well. Either way, it's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.